According to Abraham Maslow, there are six types of human needs. These needs are arranged in hierarchical order. Therefore, once an individual fulfills what is necessary in the lower levels, they are able to move up to the next level until they reach the top tier. The first level is physiological needs, which are our basic human needs, including shelter, water, and food. If a student does not have these things at home, they will not be able to come to school and focus on learning. According to Carol Ann Thompson, when a student's fundamental needs for food, safety, and respect are not met, the early brain trumps cognition. The brain's primary energy focuses on protecting its owner rather than on learning. So a student's brain will only be focusing on what they do not receive like food or water, there is no way they can come to school and learn information when they are focused on these basic needs. Our next level is safety needs. This includes not only emotional safety, but also personal safety. If a student is being emotionally or physically abused, they will not be able to focus in school. Also, if they have a home that is dangerous or there is danger around them, there is no way they will be able to come to school and learn properly. Next comes needs of belongingness. We all want to belong and feel as if we are part of a group. This comes with family support or support from friends around us, student relationships, or other skills that we may learn at home or in school. If students do not feel this, they might, may not be able to move on to love needs, which is our relationship with other people our family, our friends, or other individuals we may build relationships with around us. From this, we can move on to self-esteem. Students have a hard time with self-esteem to begin with, especially if they come from a home where they are not supported and do not learn the things necessary to reach this level. After self-esteem comes the final level, which is self-actualization. In this, students realize their own potentials, capacity, and talents. They learn what they like, what they're good at, and what they may do in their future. We can't expect students to come to school and learn if they are not having their needs met at home. Carol Ann Tomlinson also states, it reminds us that the goal of life is self-actualization. Humans want to become the best that we can be. Seems to me, that should be the goal of the classroom as well, helping young learners progress a bit more each day with their best selves. We want students to be able to find what they enjoy in order to take the classes they like, um, to plan out their future. Tomlinson later states, our role isn't only to understand the basic trajectories of a healthy life and the right course when a student is off course it's also to understand the trajectories of learning in the disciplines we teach so we can confidently invite students into their varied points of entry. We want to create students that are comfortable in themselves and know what they enjoy and want in life rather than have students worrying about if they may eat at home, if they have a safe home to go to, um, if their family is gonna protect and love them. While we cannot change these things for students all the time, we can do our best as educators um, to offer different things in our classroom to support these children. In this class, we have learned things such as um, hands-on learning, um, giving the students the ability to choose what they like in the classroom and participate. Um, another thing we have learned that it is important for students to build relationships with one another. Um, so we need to do activities that they can uh, work together and form those bonds. While we can't take these kids out of their homes, we must provide the best environment for when they come to school because they spend most of their time in school in the young years. Another thing that I've learned is that students like having an organized classroom. Using these different things in our classrooms can help students come in and learn to the best of their ability. Another thing that we implemented in our school is um, a breakfast program or having snacks in our classroom. While this might seem silly or something small 
to most individuals, there are students who do not eat when they are at home. This is a problem that we had seen during the pandemic. Some of those students only ate when they were in school. So we were able to set up meal programs and deliver food to those children. While as educators, sometimes we take ourselves away from the fact that we do have students that are struggling in these ways, um, we always need to be reminded that not we don't always know what these students are going home to or what they may suffer with. Um, which leads me into another point that as educators, I believe that we must learn as much as we can about students and their background. If we know a student comes from a rough home life, we can do our best to um, nourish them and give them what they need um, in the school. With these things, I think that we can help students. This is a learning process for everyone, but I believe that by sharing information between educators, we can only learn more and do better at helping these students to be their best selves and realize what they want in life and reach that final level of self-actualization. Hi, we're here with Mrs. Tamla Marshall. She's been an educator for 21 years now and currently teaches at the Jefferson County Vocational School. We're gonna talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how that relates to the educational system. So Tamla, what warning signs have you seen in students that show their basic needs are not being met? The warning signs are very similar uh, universally. It doesn't depend on the age. Um, tiredness, crankiness, withdrawn symptoms, um, depression, um, we still have students that, at the high school level that have emotional outbursts mm -hmm. and cry, um, even boys, mm -hmm. um, you know, withdrawn, uh, standoffish, moody, uh, don't want to talk to anyone, um, you know, and it's really hard as an instructor because you don't want it to interfere with your, the educational process yet you feel the need to, you know, help this student mm -hmm. without taking away time from the other students. It's a very difficult balance. Right. So how does this affect their learning in school? A lot of students have the attitude, because I have 11th and 12th graders, um, that I'm never going to use this, so I don't really care if I don't do well. And, you know, as a teacher, you know that it's not to take it personally. Mm -hmm. You know that this, they're not, uh, this isn't displacing their opinion of you. It's, you know, there's something going on emotionally, internally, at home or with a boyfriend, girlfriend, work. You know, the older students have much more complex problems mm -hmm. than the younger students and they also have some of them harder ways of demonstrating that or even wanting to share that with you because they feel embarrassed and ashamed at this point in their at their age right so in the class what changes have you implemented if you see a student struggling first thing I do is um, I know right away when they're walking down in the hallway coming into my class, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of judge because I've been doing this for a long time, what kind of their mental attitude. Mm -hmm. And especially after knowing them, getting to know them, and that's the most important thing is, that's the very most important thing is to get to know your students. Um, then you can spot behaviors and winning their trust mm -hmm. is probably the hardest thing to do with older kids. Right. Because, you know, they're afraid that if they can find in you, who are you going to tell mm -hmm. elsewise? And they're afraid of, you know, impounding, you know, problems being created from the school. Mm -hmm. So the older children have a really difficult time wanting to confide in you. That's the most important thing. Getting their trust. I think mm -hmm. if they trust you, they're more open to you. And then once I get their trust, it's just taking them aside. 
Right. Pulling them aside, talking to them, you know, what's up? Um, mm -hmm. What can I do to help you? Um, a lot of students don't have that, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of them are so busy with school and they have to work for financial reasons and they don't have anyone to talk to mm -hmm. and confine in. And that's not judgmental mm -hmm. and not giving them negative feedback constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the two biggest things, getting them to trust you and getting them to confide in you. Right. Once that occurs, I think you can, for the most part, students want to do well. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the desire and they like that affirmation of good job, you know, and, you know, nice to see you and a smile mm -hmm. when you see them. You know, they're always, they're looking for their needs to be filled. Mm -hmm. They just don't have sometimes the proper way of going about demonstrating it. Yeah. And, and they're so used to being, you know, pushed off to the mm -hmm. side. And that's the biggest issue I find is that, you know, as long as they don't create trouble in the classroom, mm -hmm. they'll just push them aside and, right. you know, push them ahead. And, you know, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've noticed teaching mm -hmm. is in a public, in a public school, mm -hmm. is if the children don't give you a hard time, let's just push them through the system. Yeah, so basically you're saying like we, number one, really need to get to know our students and then on top of that, help them so that they can really reach that last um, self-actualization or what they want and need rather than be stuck in the love, need for love and belongingness, which it seems like a lot of your kids are. Yeah, yeah, and you know, just because they're young adults doesn't mean emotionally they are at that age mm -hmm. level. And that's the biggest change I've noticed. Um, and whether it's children are so used to being by themselves, mm -hmm. playing video games, not interacting like they did, you know, mm -hmm. A decade ago before all the video games and mm -hmm. stuff came about and Facebook and you know and, and they have a hard time um, personally talking and communicating with other people and other students in an effective positive way okay well thank you so much for your insight my pleasure After speaking with my educator, I believe there are several things that I can do in my classroom in order to better educate my students. The first thing would be to offer them breakfast or snacks if we know that they are not eating. These needs are not being met at home. While it would be ideal to take them out of a situation like that, that is not always an option. Next, I think that we need to be advocates for our students. If we know a student is not being taken care of properly, we must notify the proper authorities. Then, I think when it comes to lesson planning, we need to include not only hands-on, but an option for students to work together and build relationships with their peers. They need to know that school is a safe place, that the people around them love them, want to protect them, and want the best for them. We must also communicate with the parents. While this is not always an option, it is something that is very important for student learning. Whether that be a parent, a grandparent, or whoever the student lives in, we must constantly be in communication about the student's behavior because at times, the parents may not know how a child is acting in school. They may be taking out their aggression or problems at home in school. It's important that we let the parent know so that if they're willing to help, they can. We must treat our students as if they are our children, how we would want someone to treat our children in the school. We must love them and protect them. We must want what is best for them and do this to the best of our ability. While this is not a written job of a teacher, we are only there to educate. We have millions of unseen jobs and tasks that we must do so that our students can better learn. This is an exceptionally hard time. Um, something that we just discussed in our schools is the need for an emotional um, aspect of our lesson planning. So when students walk in, we have a chart, 
or a story that talks about how their emotional health is. While this may have always been an issue, the pandemic has really brought this to light for us. Um, adults are struggling with how hard this has been for everyone, the lack of physical connection and being able to see our loved ones for long periods of time. Students um, definitely do not understand such a difficult concept. So we must really focus on the emotional needs of our students right now, along with teaching them. This may mean our curriculum needs to change, but if these needs aren't met, according to Maslow, then they can't learn. So we really must focus on um, a whole curriculum centered around what is best for our kids and how best to achieve that. Thank you.